Guy Steele. One of the problems with introducing uh, someone like Guy is that he's just uh, accomplished so much and you have to read through the long slog of head of this, chair of that, edited this, did that. And it takes forever. And, you know, somebody started this conference yesterday by going long, and I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so, uh, so if Guy forgives me, I'm not going to read through his, uh, his bio. You can read that on the web. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there's a saying about uh, standing on the shoulders. And, you know, Guy, he's a tall guy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when I stood on his shoulders, it was amazing how uh, thin the air was. <laughs> and it's not exactly the kind of thing where I needed to uh, choose to stand on the shoulders because as I did the work uh, research and closure, uh, everywhere I turned when I was looking to learn something new or understand something better or you know, figure out how something worked, uh, there was Guy's name on the top of the paper or on the book. Uh, and so he was a tremendous influence and his work was a tremendous influence on closure. And in particular, I would just like to highlight uh, how his work shows the uh, importance and really how essential uh, precise and clear human language is to both uh, capturing and conveying the semantics of what we do. Uh, and I think we can't lose touch of that. And in addition, uh, he's shown us all how to do that really well. Uh, I don't really know what to say except that um, I owe Guy a tremendous debt of gratitude and if you're sitting in this room, you do too. Uh, so please uh, join me in both thanking and welcoming Guy Steele. Well, thank you very much, Rich. I really appreciate that. I thought you were going to keep it short, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad you did. Uh, I also stand on the shoulders of, of many giants, and I want to acknowledge that. And I've also been quite fortunate to be in the right place at the right time on several interesting projects. And I'm glad the results of those have proved to be useful to others. And someday, some of you, perhaps all of you, will be those giants and other people stand on your shoulders. So keep that in mind. OK, I'm here to tell you about uh, my new obsession. It's a, it's a programming language. It is, in fact, the most popular programming language in computer science. This is a carefully crafted claim. <laughs> uh, it has no compiler, interpreter, or specification. Uh, and yet, a lot of time has been spent writing programs in this language and hand translating both to and from this language uh, between it and other languages that do have compilers and interpreters and specifications. And uh, it's developed over quite a number of years. Uh, some of the contributors to this language are actually quite well known. Here are some of them. Gerhard Gensen, John Backus, Peter Nauer, and Alonzo Church. They didn't know they were designing this language. And there have been many other contributors over the last 20 or 30 years, who, uh, most of whom are nameless, and some of them justly so. Uh, I would tell you the name of this language, but it doesn't seem to have one. So I'm going to call it computer science meta notation. This is the language that programming language theorists use to talk to each other about programming languages. It's got built-in data types uh, that are assumed, Boolean, integer, real, complex, sets, lists, and arrays. Its primitive expressions are those of logic and mathematics. It's got user-declared data types, which you can think of as abstract data types or records or symbolic expressions. Uh, we call this BNF. BNF is used to express these. Uh, the code is written in the form of logic inference rules in the so-called Gensen notation. It's that horizontal line. We'll look at examples of that later. Um, and by the way, it's that fact of notation that makes it very hard to search for in the literature. The OCR doesn't capture that horizontal line. Uh, it has condition, several forms of conditionals, but the primary one is dispatched inference rules through non-deterministic pattern matching. We'll see an example of that. And recently has developed some interesting abbreviations for repetition, the uses of overlines or ellipsis notations, and sometimes explicit iterators. And it's got this very weird operator that's unique to this language, which is the so-called capture-free substitution operation. 
uh, within a symbolic expression, substitute this expression for that variable and this other expression. And uh, that is attributed to Alonzo Church. So this is actually a very beautiful language. And unfortunately, I hate to report that it's getting messed up. It's, got some, it's developed some problems. I've got some ideas about how to fix that. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about that to you and might even tell you a little bit about what that has to do with closure. So here's a quick example of a data declaration in computer science meta notation. This is from a 2014 paper at the Principles of Programming Languages conference. We're not going to dwell on this too long because I'm going to want to discuss it in detail later on. But you can just see that, for example, an expression can be either a variable or an abstraction or an application, and the forms of each of these are described. And this is a very terse notation. Rather, I'd like to show you a bit of the code first. Here's an example of code. This is uh, taken from, uh, in fact, the same uh, 2014 Popple paper. And here we have uh, two rules, and we also ha uh, have a signature declaration, which is very considered to the author because you don't often see those. So this declares a rule called no conflict, and it takes four parameters. There's also a comment, which is also very unusual. It says, OK, this is intended to check for equation conflicts, whatever that means. And there are two different ways you can check to make sure there's no conflict. You can either use the rule called NC apart or the one called NC compatible. And in order to prove the thing that is under the line, all you have to do is prove the things that are above the line by other means. And either rule will do. This is a non-deterministic language. If you can use either rule to prove there's no conflict, that's fine. You could even try both of them in parallel and see which one finishes first. Doesn't matter. So there's an opportunity for parallelism here. That's interesting. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to the fact uh, the use of overlines in various parts of these rules. I've highlighted these with the, the light blue. And we'll dive deeper into this notation. Uh, just note that the third argument to no conflict is actually not the, the single symbol ta, but a list of things designated ta. And for example, the function f takes a bunch of parameters, which are a bunch of rows. And in one place, the, in a couple places, the overline uh, notation is nested. Ooh. OK. Here's a different example of code. Uh, this is from a type checking algorithm uh, from uh, last year's Popple conference. That was about a year and a half ago. And if you want to prove the type of uh, an expression uh, using one of the rules below, all you have to do is prove the things above. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except first I want to point out that uh, the authors intended, and we should read it as ha actually having inputs and outputs. So this structure consisting of the turnstile symbol and a colon says, in the context gamma, if you have this input expression, I can figure out the type for you, uh, highlighted in blue, as an output. And, um, and each of the rules has, has this structure. And furthermore, this, this set of rules actually is deterministic because if you regard the thing before the colon as an input, each rule has a different pattern there. So in fact, only one of the rules is going to match. It's possible that no rule will match the expression, in which case the type checking fails. But at most, one rule will apply, and that's the one he, that, he, that the author wants you to use. And so, for example, if we look at the rule at the upper right, it says that if we have an application of a function m to an expression n, that will have type ta, providing we can prove that m is a function from sigma to ta, and the argument type is sigma. And so that's what that's saying. And this is the language that type theorists use to talk to each other. Um, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is in the middle rule, there are some ellipses there. Ellipsis is the fancy word for the three points, dot, dot, dot. And it's being used in two different ways here. In the, in the consequent, on the bottom, it's being used to indicate that op takes a sequence of expressions m, and that runs from m1 to m of arity the operator. So we're to infer that there are a whole bunch of m's in between, possibly. But there might be only one, or there might even be zero of them. On top, it's being used as an iterator, saying that the premise preceding that, that parenthesized thing, the gamma turnstile m sub k colon ta, there's actually a bunch of such premises, one for each value that i takes on. So that's called an iterator, and that's sort of a, a meta iteration construct. Don't you think it's ironic that type theorists who want to talk about strongly typed languages in a rigorous manner talk to themselves with an untyped language that has no rigorous specification? <laughs> This is really weird. OK, but it's a very concise language, and that's why they use it. OK, so I think I've, I think I've convinced you that it is a kind of programming language. I showed you one algorithm, a type checking algorithm. And in fact, I've seen type checking algorithms that are 10 or 20 pages long. And those have served as a specification for some phase of a compiler, and people hand translate that. Or maybe they look at an existing compiler and try to back translate into the type specification language and then prove some theorems about it. So it is a programming language. You can write programs in it. In fact, the language feels a little bit like prologue. And I've, as an experiment, I wrote a toy compiler that translates uh, the LaTeX expressions in my Emacs buffer 
for these, for these notations I showed you, translates them into prolog, and I was able to run the prolog code and do the type checking. You know, so that works as a toy experiment, but there's no full-blown compiler for the language. So I've shown you as a programming language. Now to complete my claim, I need to show you that it's actually popular, or at least popular. At the Popple conference, I went back and looked at all the papers and all the Popple conferences for the last 43 years. Actually, I did this last spring, so I hadn't yet seen the 2017 Popple. And breaking it down into five-year intervals, I looked at every page of every paper. This is about 17,000 pages of stuff. You, you go flipping through the proceedings, flip, flip, flip. And um, you can see the growth in time in the use of inference rules at the Popple Conference. And in the last 20 years, this notation is used in over half of all papers, which makes it much more popular than C or Python or you know, or Haskell, or anything you might think type theorist communication, let alone Fortran or COBOL. So it's a very popular language in that sense. And just to double check, I went and looked at some other uh, ACM SIGPLAN conferences as well. So I looked at three years' worth of PLDI, OOPSL, and ICFP, and six years' worth of PPOP, because I wasn't finding much in the last three years of PPOP. And you can see it's used in, a, by now it's used in about a third of PLDI papers, about a third of OOPSL papers, almost two-thirds of ICFP papers and hardly at all at PPOP. And that's not at all surprising because principles and practice of parallel programming tends to be more about what's going on at runtime. And this notation tends to be used primarily to describe what's going on at compile time, if you make that separation. OK, so now I understand something about how this language is being used. And it is popular. Uh, I'm continuing to research this. Those, the previous two popularity slides were my research as of last spring. I'm continuing to look at more conferences. So in the dark blue, blue, you can see that I've examined all the Popple conferences, and I looked at a bunch of them in the 2010s. Now I've gone back to, to 1971, and I'm plowing forward again. I've looked at a lot of the early kind of random SIGPLAN conferences that were one-off things. And I've begun to plow through PLDI and ASPLOS and Lisp and Functional Programming, which then became ICFP. And I'm hoping to learn more as I continue my research um, on this topic. But I'm going, so I've looked at about 80 conferences so far out of 216. And uh, I'm going to report on what I've found so far. So this is the structure of the talk. I'm going to examine the history and variety of five different aspects of computer science meta notation. The inference rules, BNF, the substitution operator, overline, and ellipsis. And I'm going to identify problems that have arisen with the last three, and maybe even suggest some solutions to that. So here we go. OK, inference rules. Uh, back in 1935, Gerhard Gensen published a paper for, on what, for what he called natural deduction, or he kept, called it the appropriate thing in German. This paper was written in German. I've got a couple, few excerpts here. And uh, I don't expect you to read the German. But down at the bottom, you can see that first rule says, if you can prove A and you can prove B, you are entitled to conclude that A and B is true. And the second and third rules say, if you know A and B, then you are entitled to conclude that A is true, or you may conclude that B is true. And finally, if you know A, you are permitted to conclude A or B, and similarly for B. OK, and so he's kind of redoing logic in this rule-based form. That's kind of cool. So what does that look like today? In today's modern computer science inference rule notation, about the only difference is that if we have too many premises, we're allowed to stack them uh, vertically as well as horizontally. And sometimes we label the rules. Now, I discovered a huge variation in the labels, in placement, in separation, in capitalization, whether they're alphabetic or contain symbols, uh, the size and style of the font, what word separators are used, are there multi-word labels, whether you use brackets or parentheses or yada yada to enclose them. So, so there are dozens and dozens of different label styles. It doesn't matter. People find this notation readable. The differences are not a problem. And that's the only point I wanted to make. Despite the variation, when you see an inference rule like that, you know it's an inference rule and you know what's going on. OK, now let's talk about BNF. Its history goes back a bit further. About 2,500 years ago, Panini wrote a Sanskrit grammar, which is a wonderful scholarly work containing numerous concise technical rules describing Sanskrit morphology unambiguously completely. And if you squint just a little bit, it looks just like BNF. <laughs> you know, there are these defined non-terminals, and if you want to make a noun phrase, then here, here are your choices. And each, you know, those choices will contain further non-terminals, and you can expand them. And when you're done, you've got a valid Sanskrit sentence. You know, that, that was really quite an achievement for 2,500 years ago. OK, jump forward to modern times. In 1914, Axel II studied string rewriting systems defined by rewrite rules. In 1920s, Emil Post studied a variant of this, these called tag systems, in which symbols are repeatedly replaced by associated strings. In 
He did this work in the 20s. He didn't publish it until 1943. And that matters to our story because it was about then that Church and Turing were doing their works about undecidability. And in 1947, Andre Markov and Emil Post independently proved that the word problem for semi-groups, which is a problem that Thieu had posed, is undecidable. And immediately, this is related to the, works by, the work by Church and the work by Turing on the undecidability of lambda reduction and the undecidability of uh, deciding whether the Turing machines will halt. So all this stuff was happening in the 1940s. In the next decade, Noam Chomsky published his three models for a description of language. And this described grammars with production rules in what we now call the Chomskyan hierarchy of grammars, type 0, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 0 corresponds to regular expressions. Type 1 corresponds to context-free grammars, which we can express with BNF. And then there are two kinds of context-sensitive grammars. OK, so with, ba with this background, we would expect that the further evolution of BNF and regular expressions would be very closely related, and that the regular expressions would be a subset of BNF, and they'd flow naturally out of the Chomskyan theory. Wrong. They had completely independent historical developments. OK, so let's look at regular expressions in one slide. In 1951, before Chomsky published, Stephen Claney developed regular expressions a way of describing a McCulloch Pitts nerve nets, what we would now call neural networks. And he used uh, the, the wedge symbol for a choice. And he considered using a postfix star to mean zero or more copies. But he ended up making it a binary operator so that x star y meant any number of copies of x, but then you have to have a y. And the reason for this, he was trying to avoid having empty strings come out. So if x was not empty and y is not empty, then the binary operator star will produce a non-empty string. And his work was published five years later in 1956, still had only the binary star. He didn't even talk about having considered the, the, the postfix case. However, two years later, two, three other guys, Copy, Elgett, and Wright, formulated REs using a postfix star. They said, this is obviously more convenient. We've got theorems to prove. OK, uh, four years later, Brzozowski uh, used a very similar notation, but he did two things. Instead of, he replaced the wedge with a plus symbol to indicate choice, and, but he also used a postfix superscripted plus to indicate one, the choice of one or more things rather than zero or more things. So this allowed you to sidestep the empty string problem with star when necessary. In 1968, uh, the AEDR word system, this is a programming system, provided a form of regular expression using slash, which was on the keyboard, and uh, set union for choice, which is not on the keyboard, I don't understand that, or maybe it was, and used a po postfix star. That same year, Ken Thompson wrote the seminal, seminal paper, Regular Expression Search Algorithm. Because the vertical bar was on his keyboard, he used that for choice instead, and the rest is history, as they say. Five years after that, uh, uh, Thompson, uh, in response to a request by Doug McElroy, Doug McElroy was trying to use the ed editor to process uh, these huge text corpuses that he was trying to process, and they wouldn't fit in main memory, and ed insisted, it was a kind of editor that insisted that your entire, uh, your entire file fit in main memory. And so Thompson extracted just the regular expression search part and made that be a separate utility, which he called grep. And then two years later, Al Aho made an extended version called egrep. And in this, he introduced the possibility of parentheses for grouping and also introduced the question mark for the case of 0 or 1. And I asked Aho about that and said, did you invent that? He said, I don't remember for sure, but it seemed like an obvious thing. And yeah, the question mark was there on the keyboard. Yeah, that, that was probably the invention of the question mark. <laughs> but I can't remember. That was 40 years ago. <laughs> OK, there's one more slight deviation, which is that uh, at Carnegie Mellon University, the Alfard Project used regular expressions with star for 0 or more, 1, sorry, plus for 1 and more, and the sharp sign for 0 or 1. I guess they weren't using e uh, grep and egrep uh, around there by then. But by three years later, all the technical papers at CMU were using question mark instead of the sharp sign. So the sharp sign appeared and then disappeared again. And I think that was the influence of the spread of Unix and grep. It was about then that CMU was emerging from using the PTP-10 operating systems and beginning to use Unix systems. You know, so that, that may be the influence there. And regular expression notation in computer science has been pretty much unchanged since then. So there's this 30-year evolution, and then we finally read on something that's stuck, and we can all use regular expressions and read them and know what they stand for. That's great. By contrast, let's look at BNF. Uh, BNF uh, got its start when Alan Perlis and Klaus Samuelson wrote the report on the International Algebraic Language, which very soon after became renamed ALGOL, ALGOL 60. And uh, they described some forms for various language features, what they called functions, which we would now call fu function calls. And it says a function call can be an identifier followed by a number of um, parameters, which we would now call arguments. 
uh, in parentheses, separated by commas, and look at this ellipsis in there. It's not dot, 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 it's wiggle, 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 I love that, <laughs> indicating more stuff can be in here. I've never, I've never seen that, that, that usage again. I don't know where they got that font. <laughs> and then down below, arithmetic expressions, E, and this looks a little more familiar. If we were to replace that swung dash with a colon, colon, equals, this would look just like BNF, but we weren't quite there yet. Okay, so the next year, John Backus uh, was writing this stuff up, but he was also influenced by the work of Emil Post. Remember Post working on, on tag, tag systems? So John, John Backus borrowed Post notation and wrote a specific syntax for the production rules for a context-free grammar for the international algebraic language. And this is what one of his productions looked like. And you can see that it, it looks much more familiar to us. It's got the angle brackets around the non-terminals. And it's got uh, a choice operator written by, by the word or with an overline over it. And notice that all these strokes and angle brackets are written in by hand, <laughs> you know, after having uh, typed it in some other way. So this is kind of a clunky notation. And the next year, uh, Peter Naur, when editing it for publication in the communications of the ACM, uh, decided to change the equivalence colon to e colon, colon, sorry, colon equivalence to colon, colon equals, because that could be keyboarded easily. And so he got rid of the overline or and replaced it with a vertical bar. You know, and curiously enough, uh, Ken Thompson chose that later for grep. But that, that was an independent choice here. And so this is the published form of a couple of productions from the report on LOL 60. And now we're introduced one other important innovation, which he said, we're going to make the names of the non-terminals in the syntax identical to the English phrases we're going to use in the informal text to describe them. And that will make it easier for readers to connect the formalism with the prose. It may seem like a trivial thing, but he laid that down as a rule and it stuck. Now, at about the same time, an alternative arose, which is COBOL meta notation. The COBOL report didn't use BNF at all. It used this two-dimensional notation where choices are stacked vertically and within braces, and square brackets are use, used to indicate optional items. And the ellipsis, the dot, 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 indicates that you may repeat the preceding item. What's interesting here is that in this report, the use of braces and brackets was carefully documented, and the use of the ellipsis was completely taken for granted and not described at all. Seems, seems like a curious oversight. Okay, these two notations got synthesized in 1965 in the description of the PO1 programming language. IBM specification combined BNF with COBOL meta notation. Uh, in the top box, you can see some rather badly formatted BNF. They could have chosen those line breaks a lot better. And at the bottom, you see use of something that looks much more like the COBOL meta notation. Okay, that's 1965. Uh, an ellipsis indicated a non-zero number of repetitions of the preceding item. But by combining the use of the ellipsis and the square bracket, you could get zero or more repetitions. And notice that they wrote square bracket item dot, 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 rather than square brackets with the dot, dot, dot inside. So this means you can actually, have, you can actually repeat your choice to have zero or one. They didn't think that closely about it, I guess. The grammar comes out the same, but if we were making grammar parsing tools, it would matter to the parser which you chose. Okay, I couldn't resist that footnote. Okay, at about that time, Niklaus Wirtz's description of PL360 used a parameterized form of BNF, where the non-terminals can have a parameter K in them, and that K can be filled in with any data type. So that's interesting. So there's actually more rules in the grammar than there are, uh, than there are lines on the page, so to speak. So one rule here, K register, stands for a set of rules defining long real register, integer register, real register, and so forth. And Adrian van Weingarten, in describing L68, took that a step farther using what's now called a van Weingarten grammar, or a two-level grammar, in which the real grammar for the language has an infinite set of productions. That's OK, because the productions of that grammar are defined by another grammar. This turned out to be really hard to use. Uh, it's fascinating to try to read the Algol 68 report. It's a complete description of its type system. And it's, in effect, context dependent because of this two-level structure. In 1970, the Bliss language description, which is a systems programming language used for the PDP-10 and PDP-11, it was described using BNF, but using a right arrow instead of colon, colon, equals. That's probably because Chomsky used right arrow, and a lot of people who speak of grammars as opposed to BNF will use the right arrow rather than colon, colon, equals. And they took this notation for granted. On the other hand, when Digital Equipment Corporation uh, took this over uh, as a corporate language, uh, their Bliss documentation used PL1 style syntax descriptions. Maybe they thought those were more user friendly. Now, there's this interesting variation that appeared in the 1970s called syntax charts or railway diagrams as an alternative to BNF. And the idea is you start at the left-hand side and you follow the arrows like a choo-choo train going round and round the tracks. And whatever you hit along the way, 
by the time you get to the end of the string, by the time you get to the out arrow on the right, you have formed a valid piece of syntax by, by following the railway diagrams. These used to be really popular but for about a decade and then died out again. Okay, uh, perhaps the best known uh, language that used it was the red language, but red got beat out and uh, green became Ada and blue and yellow were never heard from again either. If red had become Ada instead of green, we might be using syntax charts today. Who knows? Accidents of history. Okay, by 1977, Niklaus Wirt noticed that there were a bunch of variations in BNF plus these syntax charts, and he wrote this lament and published it in CACM and said, what can we do about the unnecessary diversity of not notation for syntactic definitions? You know, a, a lament only Wirt could append. <coughs> and he solves the problem of having too many BNF variants by proposing yet another. <laughs> and uh, this paper is notable for two things. One is that his variant actually caught on and became an ISO standard and we now call it extended BNF. And the other is that this is the first uh, occurrence I can find of BNF being used to describe its own grammar. And this is possible because of the way he uses double quotes as escaping symbols, which had not previously been a feature of BNFs. He also introduced the idea, as nearly as I can tell, of having a specific symbol, in this case the period, to mark the end of the production as a separator produ between productions. Okay, there are lots of other variants, and I'm not going to uh, tax you uh, too much with them. I will just point out that uh, Stanford Sale Language, the Alfard Project, uh, the ADA specification used BNF, but it used boldface words rather than colon, colon, equals, and the vertical bar it used boldface is and boldface or. Uh, there are a bunch of variants that synthesized um, regular expressions in BNF, and uh, since since uh, Sam Harbison and I were at CMU at the time that was happening at CMU, we ended up using a version of BNF that included regular expressions in our books about C and Common Lisp. So that's where that came from. Uh, the Python reference manual uh, uses both the postfix star and the postfix plus in, uh, in its BNF, but it uses brackets rather than question mark for the optional items. Why? Why not? Uh, the Haskell 98 report uses a variant. Ruby uses an interesting variant in what it calls pseudo BNF but it also uses brackets rather than question mark for optional items. And then there's C-style BNF, which also got adopted by Java and C-sharp and F-sharp, in which instead of colon, colon, equals, you just use a colon. We don't bother with the vertical bars. We just make sure that every alternative is on a separate line, unless we use the magic words one of, in which case we can string them all on the same line, which provides some conciseness when you're printing books. And so this is an interesting variation also. And uh, you're probably familiar with this. So, we've seen a huge variety of BNF variations in the last six decades, and I think the consensus is, by and large, that this also has not been a problem. And I think the reason for that is that although the punctuation changes, the basic structure of it has not. Uh, you always see a non-terminal, and then some kind of marker, and then a bunch of choices, and they're separated by some kind of marker, and for each choice, there are some things concatenated, and you can further expand the non-terminals. And yeah, you gotta kind of infer what means zero or more, and what means one or more, and if you're lucky, the author told you that. Okay, and so, so we kind of get along, and it's fine. It hasn't been a huge problem, just despite the variation. Okay, now, I promised to, that I would show you this, uh, this uh, version of BNF from a computer science paper. And on the one hand, it's identifiably BNF. It's got that colon, colon, equals. It's got choices separated by vertical bars. And yet, it looks very different in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, all the non-terminals are single letters. What happened to Peter Naur's dictum that the non-terminal should be an expressive phrase to tell you what it means? Well, instead, they've been replaced by single symbols, but they, comp they uh, co uh, compensate for that by putting comments over on the right-hand side, saying, well, the choices are variables and abstractions and applications. E stands for an expression. TOS stands for a type. So this would seem to be counterintuitive. Uh, why not just use the word expression and type? Why make you remember that E stands for expression and TOS stands for type? Got a theory about that. Page limits in computer science uh, conferences. Your entire paper has to fit in 10 pages. You are going to compress that notation like crazy until it fits. And I think that's what's happened here in computer science meta notation. I'm not going to dwell on it too much further except to point out that here in the BNF, this particular example BNF, we're also seeing use of the overline notation to indicate repetition rather than either recursion or Claney's original star operator. Okay, so what's, what's with these overlines? We'll return to that. But the point is, is that BNF as used in computer science meditation is the same as old BNFs and yet very different in a couple of ways that lend conciseness. And that, I believe that conciseness is considered to be one of the prime virtues of this version of the notation. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the, about the properties of substitution of, of, uh, of uh, BNF. 
BNF has two conventions that aren't often talked about. One is something I call the Consistent Substitution Convention. Now, we're used to saying that with BNF, you can replace the non-terminal on the left-hand side with the thing on the right-hand side, and if there are non-terminals there, you can further replace them. And on the right-hand side, the same non-terminal might appear more than once, and that's okay. And you can expand each one differently if you want to. But we don't do that when we're use, right, using these same non-terminals in prose. If we use the BNF convention that every non-terminal can be replaced by any string derived from that non-terminal, then we could take an English sentence such as, a value of type tau may be assigned to any variable of type tau. And OK, for the first tau, I'll substitute integer. And for the second one, I'll substitute bool. Cool. A value of type int may be assigned to any variable of type bool. That's not what we want to say. So when we're using, when we're, when we're merging BNF with English, or other natural languages, we use this consistent substitution convention because we want to be able to talk about things and mention them more than once. So if I mention the same non-terminal more than once, I insist that it be expanded the same way, at least within the same sentence, if not within the same paragraph. So that forces me to say a value of type int may be assigned to any variable of type int. That makes sense. So that's this consistent substitution convention. The other property of this language is something I will call the decorated non-terminals convention. By decoration, I mean things like subscripts or primes or little hats, little, little decorations you add onto the usually single letter uh, non-terminal. If we took the definition of BNF not literally, then when we write a sentence such as, if tau1 equals tau2, then tau1 is a subtype of tau2, then if I expanded it by replacing each tau with int, then I would get if int sub 1 equals int sub 2, then int sub 1 is a subtype of int sub 2, which is something I might want to say, but it usually isn't. There aren't any types int sub 1 and int sub 2. Rather, I really mean that the tall ones are a type and the tall twos are a type and they have nothing to each other. And those can be expanded independently, but the two tall ones had better stand for the same thing. So I, what I really want to say is I, the sentence up top stands for things like, if int equals bool, is then int is a subtype of bool, which is a true sentence because, in fact, int is not equal to bool. And I can also say that if int equals int, then int is a subtype of int, which is a true sentence. In fact, int is int and int is a subtype of int and everything's fine. Okay, so we need to, to understand this language, we need to understand those two conventions. Okay, that's enough about BNF, let's talk about substitution. Completely different set of issues here. In 1932, Alonzo Church used this notation, a capital S, and then a superscript expression, a subscript expression, and then an expression U off to the side, and then a vertical bar just to close it off. That was his notation. And that represents substitution replacing the variable x by the formula y throughout the, the formula u. Now, in 1941, when he published the Calculi of Lambda Conversion, the seminal work on the Lambda Calculus, he had refined this to say you, may, you can replace, um, use this replacement operation provided that the bound variables in m are distinct both from the variable x you're substituting for and from the free variables of n. So now instead of just becoming a pure string substitution, this has become something much more subtle and technical. The so-called capture-free substitution that avoids accidentally capturing bound variables or being captured by a bound variable. Nowadays, in computer science meditation, we write something like this for it. Instead, we write an expression E, and then in brackets, we write a value expression, then a slash, and then a variable X. And this means E with V substituted for X throughout. Okay, so is this used in all computer science uh, papers? Not by a long shot. There are a bunch of variations as of BNF. How many variations would you say there have been in just the Popple conferences in the last 43 years? Any guesses? 12. 12, okay, another guess. We're 42. Okay. <laughs> in fact, I've cataloged 32 varieties. <laughs> And here they are, and uh, they fall into some categories, whether, whether the brackets come before or after the expression being substituted, what kinds of brackets you used, whether you used a slash or a backslash or an arrow or a colon equals. They're different authors who use different ones. One is far and away the favorite, and that's the one I showed you on the previous slide that you see that in the middle of line three. Uh, the second favorite is exactly the same, but with E on the right instead of on the left. And that's used in about one third of all papers. Uh, or or there's a two to one ratio, I should say. And then the, the other three other most popular notations are highlighted. The one involving the colon equals is probably popular because H.P. Berendrecht used it in his uh, monograph on the lambda calculus, which is a well-respected work. And I don't see it appearing in the Popple conference until after Berendrecht published. Now, I double-checked and looked at some other conferences, and so when I looked at 
uh, five years worth of popple and three years worth of other conferences, I was able to fill in the holes of the table. I now see 33 varieties. And of those, uh, sorry, 34 varieties. And of those 34 varieties, uh, 19 are still in live use within the last five years. So it's not just that variations have appeared and then been superseded by others. Uh, I've got other charts that show that the number in live use has been continuing to grow steadily over the years. And if you look at just the last five year interval, 19 of them are still in live use. And uh, this is scary for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, here's a moderate problem. By far the most popular form is E with V slash X, but once every five years you see E with X slash V. <laughs> the author gets it right, gets it backwards for no apparent reason and doesn't explain why and probably just forgot it's, that the convention is the other order. And you can't count on the variable names to keep tip you off because different authors actually use different variable names in practice. So all you see is the brackets and the slash, and you're not sure which way, which way the substitution is going. So that's a bit of a problem. One paper published last year actually used both forms in the same paper. It was probably a typo, but, but it happened, and I, thought I caught it. Here's a bigger problem, which is that these forms with the maps to arrow and the colon equals and other variants that use prefix forms or braces. These forms are frequently used for substitution in about one-sixth of all popple papers, but they are also widely used to express a completely different, op different operation called function update or map update or storage update, where f, but changed so that x maps to v, when applied to z means that if z is x, then return v and otherwise return f of z. In other words, you're taking one argument of f and changing its output. And that's a very different operation from substituting throughout an expression. But these notations are used for both purposes in the literature, and sometimes both notations are used in a single paper. Worse yet, I've even seen the bracket slash notation normally used for substitution also used for map update in the same paper. You know, so, and, and what makes it worse is that because the continuing pressure uh, on on uh, to keep your pay paper within 10 pages or 15 or 20 or whatever the limit is now. As the programs you write get bigger, something's got to give and what's going is the explanations in the notation. And so authors are taking the notation for granted and not explaining which variation of the notation they're using. And this is what I think is producing uh, a minor crisis in computer science right now. Papers are hard to read. Professors and students are noticing this and I think we need to do something about it. So I see three ways out. One is to take my recommendations. I'll kind of pretend to be Nikos Veert here and say, do it my way. And I've got a specific set of uh, recommendations that make sense. I won't bore you with them. You can, you can look at the screen or look at the slides every, any, every, uh, while I talk. So one possibility is do it my way. Another is to insist that every author come up with a different variant whenever he writes a new paper, because then he will be forced to explain it. The third possibility would be some interesting technology for reading the paper so that when I read a paper, I can substitute my favorite substitution notation for the one that loser used. <laughs> so that's a, that's a technical option also, but harder to implement. But we've got a problem with, here is a case where variety of notation actually has become a problem because we aren't just seeing the same elements in the same order in the notation. The same elements are appearing in different permutations and with different punctuation, and you can't just look at it and sort it out. Okay, now let's talk about the overlines. Good. Okay, history of overline notation. Back in 1484, uh, Chouquet used an underline to group mathematical symbols together. In 1525, Rudolph used dots. So when he wrote the, the third sign for square root and then a dot, that meant there's a separation between the square root operation and everything that follows. And therefore, the, 12, the plus 12 gets grouped with the square root of 140 and then you take the square root. That's what the dot means. Uh, later that century, Tartaglia used parentheses for mathematical grouping. Oh, wow, an innovation. Uh, uh, nearly a century later, William Ottred used two dots to indicate two grouping. Why did he use two dots? Well, he wanted to use one dot for something else in his notation. So he said, okay, well, I'll use two dots for the grouping. Six years later, Rene Descartes attached an overline as a grouping symbol to the third symbol, producing what is now the modern square root symbol. And in this form, the overline notation survives to this day and is widely used as a grouping function, not just as an indication of square root. Everything under the overline gets square rooted. In 1640, uh, Jan Stampun used all three together. <laughs> he, wrote, he added up three things, and then he put parentheses around it, and then an overline, and then a dot just to be sure. <laughs> he was taking no chances of being misinterpreted. <laughs> Worked. A uh, little later, uh, von Schoten, editing the works of the mathematician Vietta, used overline exclusively for grouping in uh, editing the works of that mathematician. 
But in the 1700s, Leibniz began, what, who, while during the part of his career in the 1600s had been using overlines, decided to switch to parentheses. And the reason was technological. He said, the parentheses are so much easier for my friends, the typesetters, than setting the overlines, because they involve only, only horizontal things need to be squeezed in and then mechanically clamped together. Whereas if you use overlines, and you have to clamp things vertically. It was, it was a much harder process. And so he said, he said, yeah, yeah, let's use parentheses. And in fact, a noted mathematical German's journal said, yeah, we're going to switch to the Leibnizian notation. And we're going to use parentheses going forward. And starting from 1728, Euler and the Bernoulli brothers popularized the use of parentheses. And I think it's due to them that we are using parentheses today primarily. On the other hand, in the 1800s, Piano, the guy who did you know, piano arithmetic and all that, uh, reintroduced the dots. And in fact, he uses different numbers of dots in different places. And you can think of the number of dots as being the binding weakness. There's no dot between B and C, so they bind tightest. tightest and then where there's one dot, OK, then that binds to D. And then two dots, you get to bind to A. So more dots means things are pushed further apart. And those might have died out completely, except that in 1910, Russell and Whitehead, when they wrote the famous Principia Mathematica, that great work, decided to use the dots. <laughs> and they kept the dots alive when they could have died out. So we've had three different notations for grouping, duking it out for five centuries. The parentheses, the overline, and the dots. And I'm still not quite sure who's going to win, although we see parentheses seem to be popular right now, but as we will see. Now let's talk a little bit about vectors. Vectors play a part in this story. Uh, you may have heard, learned about argon diagrams in high school for graphing complex numbers. And uh, he speaks of the square root of minus one as expressing a rotation in the, in the plane geometrically. And he proposed that vectors be notated by writing the symbol for the start point, the symbol for the end point, and a little arrow over it. It's that overline arrow I'm interested in. Uh, 20 years later, Hamilton recast the theory of complex numbers as a pure algebra on a pair of reals. He said, let's not worry about whether the, whether the square root of one is a legitimate thing to talk about or not. Let's just talk about pairs of reals. And there's this interesting algebra, and we can do things with it. He said, OK, we've got this great algebra. I've proved that it has all these wonderful properties. Uh, you know, uh, multiplication, distribu uh, sorry, uh, yeah, multiplication distributes over addition and all these wonderful things. Now let's do the same thing for triplets. And let's do the same for quadruplets and all these things. Surely those must exist also. Let's look for them. And he spent a fruitless 10 years trying to find the algebra on triplets and kept failing. And then suddenly one day had a flash of insight and discovered the quaternions, which are like complex numbers on steroids. Instead of a plus bi, it's a plus bi plus cj plus dk. So you actually got three square roots of minus one, which serve as, serve as a basis vector for three-dimensional space. But you got this fourth thing, this a, which is a scalar quantity that tags along. And then once he discovered the quaternions, he reformulated them without the IJK coordinates and described the quaternion as a more abstract thing as simply the sum of a scalar and a vector, where the vector was a three-dimensional part. And James Maxwell, when formulating Maxwell's equations and writing other things about physics, used quaternions to describe his theory. But he said, it must be admitted that this notation is a little bit clumsy for my purposes. Uh, in 1881, Gibbs established the now familiar dot and x for what we now call the dot product and cross product, although those are not true products. They don't actually have the properties of a product, but we call them products anyway because they're sort of like products. They don't have all the algebraic properties, just some. And it's the fact that they only had some of the algebraic properties of a product but not all that caused a mathematical backlash. And in 1882, Heaviside, the physicist, said, let's just ditch the scalars and just use vectors for describing physics. That's just the part we want. And the mathematician said, no, you can't do that. The vectors are mathematically terrible. They're ugly and inelegant. And the quaternions have all these wonderful, beautiful algebraic properties, and we can prove theorems. And the physics said, we just want to, all we want is that when we take the dot product of a vector with itself and then take the square root to get, it, to get the length of the vector, we don't want the, the square root to be of a negative number. Because the quaternions have this weird property that when you take the dot product, it comes out negative. When you're using quaternions, the signs are flipping all over the place, and that drove the physicists nuts. They want to take their square roots and not have to worry about it. So in the 1890s, there's this big fight between the quaternionists and the vectorists. And the vectorists won. And modern formulations of physics use vectors, not quaternions. Quaternions are still widely used in computer graphics codes because they're great for expressing rotations of the camera. But vectors won out. And the reason this is relevant to computer science is because then people started thinking of vectors as tuplets of integers and yeah, they've got these interesting algebraic properties, but they're tuplets of integers. They are arrays of integers. And by the time we get to the 1950s, we're thinking of things like interrupt vectors and dope vectors in computer science. 
that have nothing at all to do with physics. And when I talk to my physics uh, friends about computer science, they cringe when I mention, say, oh, I've got this vector of characters. What? How do you take the dot product of that? You know? <laughs> no, I just mean one dimensional array. Well, why didn't you say so? Well, we call them vectors. You can't do that. You know? <laughs> so, there, so now there's another fight. You can't win. OK, so how this feeds into the Popple Conference. In the 1970s, both a little arrow over symbol or just a plain overline, just dropping the little arrowhead because who needs it, are used to represent a vector or a list or a sequence or a set, but it's, it's defined as being enclosed. So A arrow means a bunch of A's, you know, from A sub 1 through A sub N, and we'll separate it by commas and we'll slap a mess angle of brackets around it so you know it's contained. By 1981, this overline notation is, be is beginning to be taken for granted in computer science papers at Popple. By 1989, there's another innovation, which is that an arrow over symbol explicitly indicates an unenclosed sequence, because then you can write two of them next to each other with just a comma, and you get concatenation for free. You can just use the comma to indicate concatenation rather than a special concatenation operator. OK, so so far, the semantic model underlying this use of an overline or a little arrow in computer science papers, the semantic model seems to be that it marks a variable as representing a sequence. And a syntactic model is that you can make copies of the overline name and attach sequential subscripts. So that A with an arrow means A sub 1 comma A sub 2 comma A sub 3, however many A's you like. You can expand it any number of A's you please. Okay, in 1990, we see the first explicit claim that in fact the elements aren't just variables, they can be metasyntactic variables, maybe non terminals of a BNF. And so we, when we write alpha sub 1, we mean a bunch of alphas, and those alphas in turn can be further expanded into something else. In 1990, we also see the first use of what I call an implicit unit of replication. An author wrote M with an overline, and then one colon, and then sigma with an overline, and he says, this doesn't mean a bunch of M's and then a colon and a bunch of sigmas. This means M1 colon sigma 1, comma dot dot dot, comma M sub K colon sigma K. So even though the colon doesn't have a line over it, it's getting copied also. That's a little weird. How do we know what is the amount being copied? There's an inference being made there. He didn't explain how to do that. In 1993, we first see the claim in a paper that overline may be applied to any syntactic object. So this author instead wrote m colon sigma with an overline over the whole thing and said, that's the amount I want copied. This is fascinating. We started with a vector notation. And by now, in computer science, it has reacquired the original grouping function of an overline in mathematics. So it's funny how these things come around. But now we've got a problem. We know how much is to be copied, but how do we know where the subscripts are to be, to be attached? Why is the result m1 colon sigma 1 rather than m colon sigma and then a single subscript attached to the whole thing? Or if you're saying, well, you, well, you can't attach to sigma, you have to attach to all the symbols, then why doesn't the colon get a, get a subscript? You know, you can invent plausible rules for how this ought to be done, but no one's written those rules down, and that's my point. In 1994, we start to see the use of nested overlines. Now that we can use them for grouping, it becomes obvious you can put one within another one. And by 1996, the overline notation gets taken for granted. But we begin to see uh, the explicit statement of a, of a convention that was always there but had not been stated. We implicitly assume that when we uh, group some things together, in fact, they haven't explicitly grouped it here, but when we, write Z, when we substitute a bunch of Zs for a bunch of Ys, we assume that we have the same number of Zs and Ys. I call this the equal length convention. And more generally, if you overline and get, get a bunch of things duplicated, you want to get the same number of each thing you're duplicating. And in 1997, a paper tries to justify this by saying, well, we'll explain this in terms of pointwise extension of scalar operations. By abuse of notation, operations on singletons are implicitly extended pointwise to sequences. And we immediately run into a problem. In that paper, what does gamma of b bar equals substitute t's for x's and p's mean? Well, if you treat both equality and substitution operators by pointwise extension, you get the conjunction listed at the top. It says that gamma of b1 equals t1 substituted for x1 and p1 and so forth. And that's a very plausible interpretation. But in fact, what the authors had intended was the thing at the bottom. That all the substitutions are the same. Each substitution has a bunch of t's and a bunch of x's. And the number of t's and x's is completely independent of the number of b's and p's. And somehow that's not quite captured by that notation there in the top line. So different problem. So as each author tries to solve a, pr a perceived problem in previous papers, new problems get introduced. And so language grows and evolves. Okay. 
So the reaction was perhaps we should use nested overlines and some authors would write it this way instead. And superficially this seems natural. It says, okay, the T's and the X's are together and the, the B's and the P's are together. But how do we know the gamma doesn't get a subscript? That's a letter too. Well, maybe you do a dimensional analysis. Okay, but that's a semantic explanation rather than syntactic explanation. And finally, we reach the point in about the last 15 years where different writers in functional programming have found that they want both of these usages. When they write an overline over P equals a substitution applied to Q where the substitution itself has an overline, that author almost invariably wants the same number of P's and Q's and the same number of V's and X's, but it's the same substitution in each equation. On the other hand, when they're describing the syntax of a case statement, they use the same nested overline. They say, okay, a case statement has a bunch of clauses, and each clause is a constructor followed by a bunch of arguments followed by an expression. But I want each case clause to have a different constructor, and each constructor may have a different number of arguments. So the Y's can be different. And with a purely syntactic theory, we can't have it both ways. We can't stretch this, new, this use of nested overlines to mean both things. So I began to study this formally as a problem in language design. What do we want from a formal overline notation? Well, first of all, if we take any string with an overline over it, we like that to represent any number of copies of the string, maybe separated by commas, maybe enclosed or not. Those are details. Each copy of the string can be expanded differently. We generally want that. Um, but within each copy of the string, within each copy of the string, multiple occurrences of the same BNF terminal should be expanded the same way. It's as if we'd just written one copy, we want that same semantics. If we write overline stir and mention it more than once in a different context, we want the expansion of each of those overline notations to be the same for the same reason or for BNF nom terminals. In English prose, we need to be able to mention the same thing more than once and have it mean the same thing. We'd also like to retain the old tradition that if instead of using BNF non-terminals, we just use variable names. If a variable name occurs within stir, then copy i of the stir should refer to v sub i. We intend subscripting. And finally, all variables occurring in the stir should have the same length. We want to continue to impose the same length convention. So what principles can we extract from the set of desires? Well, I see two. One is that if a notation explicitly appears in more than one place on the paper, if you use different ink or different space on the screen, then all such explicit copies have to be given the same expansion. So if we write f of e and e and e explicitly, our intent is that those are the same expression e. And you can override this default by decorating it on terminals. If I wanted the expression to be different, I could write f of e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3. So I can say it either way. That's cool. On the other hand, if copies of a string are made virtually through the overline notation, then we want the copies to have different expansions, because that is the convenient thing for us to use it for. So when we write f of e bar, that means f can have a whole bunch of, a bunch of expressions and arguments, and the expressions can all be different. And we actually have a way to express this by decorating on terminals. If we say that x bar expands to x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, and plug that back in for the x bar, and then further say, oh, and by the way, x is a BNF non-terminal, well, they've been decorated so they can expand differently. Everything's cool. And on the other hand, if x was a variable, then they, it's correctly subscripted. So this is great. But we have no way in the notation to override this default. And that's the problem. That is the source of the problem. So here's I proposed, how I propose to solve this essential contradiction. I'm going to borrow uh, an idea from quasi-quoting, what enclosure is called syntax quoting. A back quote followed by an S expression means make a copy of the S expression, but wherever there's a comma, that I'm speaking with a Lisp accent here, that means except here, don't make a copy of it, instead evaluate it and use its value. Closure has this with a slightly different syntax. And uh, Danny Hillis and I used a similar idea to express parallelism in connection machine Lisp back in 1986. Alpha in front of an S expression means evaluate many copies of this S expression, one on each processor. But a bullet means except here. A bullet means take the value of that expression and it will be a vector, yeah, a vector in the computer science sense, and use a different vector element on each processor. It'd use a different element in each copy. And this proved to be a convenient notation. So what I propose to do in computer science meditation is to add underlines. And in effect, an underline cancels the effect of an overline. <laughs> okay, maybe it's too cute, but I've, I've tried using it in practice. It seems, I find it convenient, and I'm trying to persuade other people. So in this modification, overline stir can expand to any number of copies of the string stir, and each copy of stir may be expanded differently, but an underline means except here. 
An underlined portion of the stir must be expanded the same way in each copy. And this gives you the way to override the default. So we can write a big overline, P equals the substitution applied to Q, and the substitution has a, a nested overline in it. Well, then I put an underline under the whole substitution operator, meaning it's going to be the same substitution in all of the outer copies of the equations. And that works great. On the other hand, if I'm trying to describe case clauses, I don't use an underline, and I'm allowed to use different Ys in different case clauses. Uh, if I write um, uh, this thing where gamma implies that X is of type ta, and put an overline over the whole thing, I can underline the gamma to say underline, shouldn't, it's the same gamma for each one, don't subscript that one. Just subscript the Xs and the tas. And, uh, they can be, and, and so forth and so on. And the dimensionality of each variable is simply the number of overlines minus the number of underlines. So I can see that gamma is a scalar, because it's got an overline and an underline. And um, X is a scalar, because it's got two overlines and one underline. But on the other hand, Y is two-dimensional, because it's got two overlines and no canceling underlines. So Y is a vector of vectors. And uh, there's a mechanics for formal overline notation, and um, I think for lack of time, I'm not going to stress that too much. Just to point out that a, for a formalization of this notation needs to track two kinds of constraints. The requirements for identical expansion, wherever those requirements come from, and requirements of variables be the same length. And the insight is that if you use the original subscript attachment model for overlines, but then allow underlines to override that automatic attachment, then the usual rules for BNF non-terminals, including the same expansion uh, constraints and, uh, differing, and decoration rules, cause everything to fall out very beautifully. So the, so the history of notation actually feeds this solution in a nice way. And various constraints and traditions suggest that overlines should be expanded first, then BNF non-terminals, and then substitutions last. And I'm going to skip over the, over the formal model because I want to talk a little bit about ellipsis and still end on time because I don't want to stand between you and the party. Okay. Uh, here's this great quote that captures it all for me from a, a guy who wrote a book back in 2003. Most readers will have encountered the dot, dot, dot notation already. It is a notation that is rarely introduced properly. Mostly it is just used for that explanation, as in, for example, 1 plus 2 plus dot, dot, dot plus 20 equals 210. And we kind of infer the numbers we think are missing there, and we hope that they, are, they form an arithmetic progression and all that, you know. But most authors, including computer science, have used this notation for decades and just assume you know what they mean. In fact, its use in mathematics goes back a couple of centuries. Now, in the past, we've used ellipsis to explain overline. When authors bother to explain their overline notations, they say things like x bar means x sub 1 comma dot 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 comma x sub n. But what does that mean? Or what does it mean when I write x1 comma x2 comma dot dot dot? Or if I write E1 comma dot 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 comma EI comma dot 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 comma EN, what does that mean exactly? And are those two dot dot dots, are they working together or are they independent? You know, you probably, you probably can infer what you think I mean by that. I'm just saying that the rules haven't been written down. And I propose, in fact, that the right way to proceed is first to provide a formalization of the overline notation. That formalization can be done without using ellipses at all. And then explain the ellipsis notation using the overline notation. And therefore we, not we, therefore, we do not have any circularity in in uh, by trying to define ellipsis in terms of itself. So the basic idea is to predefine the set of standard ellipsis usage patterns to be supported. In fact, maybe you could even have user-defined ellipsis patterns, make it be an extensible language, cool. But for each set of ellipsis, expansion has to identify a matching usage pattern. And each pattern includes one or more occurrences of the ellipsis symbol, some number of copies of a separator string, and some matchable strings. And the idea is that you match the pattern against the text you're facing, use unification to find a common substructure for the matchable strings, and thereby producing a unifying substitution, and then use that to construct a corresponding overline notation that is intended to be the exp semantic expansion. So in effect, I'm just proposing to treat dot dot like yet another macro. So here's an example, a very simple example. If I see x sub zero, comma, dot, 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 comma, x sub minus one. The separator is comma, the matchable strings are x sub zero and x sub n minus one. The common structure is x sub i, where I get the first one by substituting zero for i, and I get the second by substituting n minus one for i. And then I plug that into a template. This is an extended version of the overline notation that provides an explicit range. And the result is an overline of x sub i, where i is constrained to lie between zero and n minus one. And, then you put, and that semantics is then defined separately over where you're defining the overline notation. And I've, I've, I won't show you a bunch more examples, but I've shown that I can take a bunch of examples of this notation and translate them in this way to overline notation and then explain that in another way. So that's the proposed program. So here are my conclusions. 
Computer science meta notation is a symbolic programming language, and it has its own distinctive syntax, semantics, and idioms. It's got its own peculiar user community, and that user community is subject to certain resource constraints, and some of them are unusual, such as conference paper page limits, and therefore a desire for extreme concision, which drives them to make the notations very concise, drives them to be typeless, they don't need type declarations, and a bunch of other qualities. And um, I think it's a neglected uh, stepchild of the computer science community. I think it could be a viable programming language. Uh, I think it should be an explicit object of study by computer scientists. Uh, it's a living language. Some of its notational ideas go back. Problems are developing, as they do in any growing language. I think these problems can be fixed, and I've pointed a way towards trying to solve those problems. I'd like to develop a complete formal theory of language, including the overline and ellipsis notations, which are fairly recent innovations, including the cases of nesting them. You can nest the ellipsis notation in addition to nesting the overline notation, and you can use them together, and you need to make sure that how all that works is explained. And they interact with BNF and with substitution. I'd like to apply the techniques we developed for other languages to CSM to build interpreters and compilers and IDEs and correctness checkers. They would probably involve proof checkers like COC and so forth and other tools. I'd also like to point out that there is serious opportunity for expressing parallelism in this language, and I think that closure might be an ideal implementation language for this language. And so if there's anyone here who might be interested in having a, a foot in each puddle, I'd like to talk with you. And so that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I can, I'm happy to take questions. I, I think we're at exactly 510, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, the question is, is, do I see this as primarily sort of an, an introverted language that talks about computations, or is it something that's reasonable to talk to the outside world, like uh, databases and machinery and the internet and stuff like that? I could see it growing into that. It would need to have a lot more grafted onto it to, to talk to the outside world. Uh, right now, its user community is primarily type theorists. In the 1980s, its primary community was people using horror logic to describe the logics of programs. And then there was this phase shift where the type theorists kind of took it over. Uh, so it has mostly been used for those kinds of internal purposes. Uh, it might grow if we're given the right tools, or it might not, and it might continue serving this very niche community. But I think that niche community should pay attention to its own needs. It's kind of like the ch cobbler's children going barefoot, you know, and, and they're, I think they're doing themselves in not by providing, not providing proper tools for their own tools. And I'm, I'm using they, I'm using third person. If you consider yourself part of that community, I consider myself part of that community. If you do too, consider yourself included in the, in the first person. Yeah. I think their idea of a macro is, a, is the answer. Uh, it suggests having maybe 32 different implementations of the same macro that people could then uh, come up with some sort of a reader that you could admit uh, whatever they originally would uh, assume that that particular author would get for the rest of the community. It would all be in a standardized format. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, the, that's the kind of tool thinking I'm thinking about, you know, th trying to figure out how this notation fits into a tool chain and, and, uh, and community usage. That's exactly the kind of thing I'm after. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. Uh, well, I'm, I'm claiming that the program is the type checker. Now let me go way back to the beginning of the talk. Way back to the beginning. There, I claim this is a type checking algorithm. It's a very small one, it only checks seven different kinds of syntax. But if you plug a piece of syntax in as an input, the type will pop out as the output. And the way this is executed is by taking a proposed situation, say, okay, I've got, I happen to have a lambda expression in hand and I would like to know its type. Oh, and I've got, a, I've got a, an environment gamma that gives me the types of, of symbols that may be free in this, in this piece of syntax. And in order to prove the type of a lambda expression, it says, it says the type will be sigma arrow tau, provided I can prove that, um, that the expression M is of type T when I use the environment gamma when extended by saying that X is also known to be of type sigma. 
And so in order to prove the thing on the bottom, all you have to do is prove the things on top. You can think of this as a function call. You can think of uh, the thing under the line, uh, counterintuitively, is the, the program header, is the function header, is the method uh, signature. And the thing on the top is the body. It's the things you need to prove in order to be entitled to conclude the thing on the bottom. And this is exactly the prologue programming language works. The only thing is that prologue has an inherently sequential implementation. It, used, it uses chronological backtracking. I'd love to see a parallel implementation that did a better job. Yeah. When do you expect that this work will be ready for publication? When do I expect this work to be ready for publication? I am, I've begun to write papers about this myself. I hope to get something out within the next year or so. Um, right now, I'm giving, I've given a talk or two about it. I gave a, a talk similar to this at Principles and Practice of Parallel Programming last spring. And I've uh, gave the talk to some students at MIT. So uh, now I'm giving it here. Yeah. So uh, obviously there's a lot of difficult to type, uh, you know, certain characters, difficult to lay out. I mean, I, I think people are just using layout programs to write these programs. What do you think the interface will be to the, the interpreter? Yeah, the question was, is, it, is that, um, I'll expand on the question. I noted that uh, it's hard to find these programs in literature because OCR doesn't capture them. And furthermore, they're hard to write because they're hard to keyboard. And in fact, most people who are writing such programs nowadays are using LaTeX. And uh, I would propose to actually just use LaTeX as the keyboard, the keyboarding for syntax or format for this language, knowing that it can be typeset in a beautiful form. In much the same way that Algol has a publication format. Pardon? Uh, well, I think there could be a reader that, that reads the LaTeX and turns it into some syntax tree that you could then run an interpreter on. And this is how my toy compiler demonstration worked. It actually read the LaTeX syntax uh, from my Emacs buffer. I wrote the compiler in Elisp because it was working on my Emacs buffer. And it just uh, produces a stupid parse tree from the LaTeX input and then uh, runs over the parse tree and translates it, translates it into prologue, dumps that out into a file, and then invokes a prologue interpreter, runs the program. And uh, you know, it all worked, you know, as I say, on this one toy example. It's amazing what you can do when you, when you can glue six things together that were never, ever designed to work together. <laughs> but, you can, but you can just get Python or even a make file just to get them to, to pipe, pipe together. That's also a great idea. And that's related to my idea of, I don't want to use his substitution notation, I want to see my substitution notation. And my preferred notation might be English instead of the mathematics. Makes a lot of sense. I'm going to look at this side of the room. Any questions over here? This side. Are we done? Time for dinner and a party? Thank you very much. Great talking to you.